West Tibet, the roof of the world. In the thin air, 6,000 meters high, a vast arid wasteland as far as the eye can see. In this remote corner of Western Tibet, lie the ruins of a mysterious kingdom. A kingdom whose army was feared by all its neighbors. A kingdom which once dominated trade in gold, silk and spices between India and China. It was a kingdom of fabulous wealth and great religious significance. Scholars argue that without this kingdom, Tibetan Buddhism would have withered and died centuries ago. Yet this spiritual and commercial hub, which prospered for seven centuries, vanished almost without a trace in 1630. What happened to bring this great civilization to an end? Was it the arrival of the first ever Westerners to visit Tibet? Or was it the intense rivalry between two brothers fighting for power? Why was it completely abandoned? And what silent secrets do these decapitated remains tell? To unravel this mystery, a Tibetan historian and an American archaeologist travel to the far reaches of Tibet. To these 400-year-old ruins where they will discover the answers to what happened to the extraordinary kingdom of Gugge. Today, this is all that remains of Gugge, its capital city, Saparang. The grand vision of the first kings of Gugge is reflected in this extraordinary city, literally carved into the side of a mountain. Soaring to the heavens, the height of a modern 80-story skyscraper, it is even today one of the largest structures in Tibet. Along its narrow lanes, you can almost hear the echoes of the many people who toil to gouge a city from this impenetrable mount of clay. A labyrinth of tunnels and stairs leads vertically 300 meters to the very top of the structure. The view is breathtaking. But this is only a small part of the once mighty kingdom of Gugge. At its height, it was twice the size of Great Britain. Experts believe that somewhere here lies the answer to one of the most intriguing archaeological enigmas in Asia. Who exactly built this extraordinary structure? And what could have possibly led to the downfall of this civilization? In its day, Gugge was the Florence of the East. At a time when Genghis Khan's Mongols were advancing into Central Asia and Europe, and the Crusades were being fought in Palestine, Gugge was a flourishing center of commerce, art, religion and political power. It dominated a strategic crossroads on the Silk Road between Central Asia and China. A crossroads for the numerous caravans trading gold, silk, wool and spices. Gugge was the center of sophisticated art and ideas. A magnet for artisans and intellectuals. It was at the heart of a religious renaissance and home to some of the greatest Buddhist thinkers of its time. 
Yet having prospered for seven centuries, this magnificent kingdom disappeared in 1630, leaving only an enigmatic structure, the very last remaining clue to a lost civilization. These are the first ever photographs of the Gugay Kingdom. They were captured in 1933 by Italian explorer Giuseppe Tucci. Tucci was the first Westerner to document these magnificent ruins. Tucci was awestruck by what lay before him. He wrote, In front of us the whole hillside is covered with tremendous ruins. A dead city, which seems to be keeping vigil over a tormented waste of stone. Tucci's visit to the ruins of Gugge unearthed no clues to its demise. That task would be left to two modern-day experts on Tibet. American John Beletza is an explorer and archaeologist who has studied this region's rich past for the last 20 years. Tibet is ringed by these incredibly high snow mountains. It's a limpid country of fantastic mountain ranges and broad rivers and pure lakes. Tibet is really an inspirational land. The colors in Tibet, the quality of light, the way the shadows are cast are unmatched anywhere else on our planet. Tibet is surrounded by the mighty mountain ranges of the Himalaya. To the south and west stands India, and to the north and east, China. The kingdom of Gugge occupied the arid western arm of Tibet. Saparang is a five-day drive west of the Tibetan capital of Lhasa. It is an arduous journey across unpaved roads in some of the least inhabited and harshest landscapes on the planet. The hardship and harshness of nature has forged a unique spirit in the people who live here. It is often said that Tibetans are inherently a spiritual people. I think part of it is the landscape. The Tibetan plateau is just so high, you're so close to the heavens. The closest most people would get to being at this extreme altitude would be flying in an aeroplane. It is a harsh, demanding environment. This is where Sering Gelpo, a leading international authority on Tibetan history, was born and raised. This is his land, and these are his people. Sering has brought John Beletza here to learn about ancient tales and fables from his tribal elders. Sering has become a collector of stories from Gugay's past with the help of these elders. Oral legends passed down from generation to generation, provide one of the few sources historians like Sering have to piece together the rise and fall of this lost kingdom. The tales are intriguing. The constant struggle for water in an arid, inhospitable plateau. The encounter with strangers from the outside world. Sering and John embark on a quest to solve one of Tibet's greatest mysteries. How did the mighty kingdom of Gugay flourish in the middle of a harsh desert? And what later caused its dramatic collapse in the 17th century? 
Of all the stories that shroud this lost city, there is one that is most often told. It is an extraordinary legend about a bitter power struggle between two brothers that eventually brought this magnificent 700-year-old kingdom to a bloody end. One brother was the last king of Gugge. His name was Chidakpo, and he was considered both the religious and political ruler of the land. The other was the chief abbot of one of Tibet's greatest monasteries. What is said to have begun as an argument over authority turned into a bitter, ongoing dispute, fueled by jealousy and the thirst for power. This, it is speculated, is one plausible explanation for the eventual demise of Gugge. There are a lot of stories out there about how the Gugge kingdom finally ended. We know that all through its history, there were intrigues, there were times that the royalty was assassinated, the king lost his position, usurped by a, by a brother or a half-brother, and so there were problems all along the way. King Chidakpo came from a long line of royalty who had ruled the kingdom from the extraordinary acropolis at Saparan. This unusual structure was once a burgeoning metropolis, a city fortress. Today, it's an archaeological bonanza for explorers like Beletsa. Oh, Saparan is a wonderful place to, to wander about. It's like reliving your childhood in a way, exploring all the nooks and crannies, seeing things for the first time. I mean, uh, you never know what you're going to discover in the ruins. I mean, it, it brings the civilization alive and its people and its beliefs. The heart of Chidakpo city was a sophisticated labyrinth of tunnels connecting the many caves called Pugos. But not all caves were created equal. The base of the city complex is where the poor, foot soldiers, farmers and their families lived. These laborers worked the fields, constructed public works and served the rich. They were the foundation of Chodakpo's kingdom. Out here in the extreme harsh climate, a cave made quite a comfortable home. The clay walls provided insulation from both the searing heat of summer and the freezing cold of winter. Climbing up the mountain also means climbing up the social ladder. Living in caves halfway up were merchants, the middle class and monks. Further up, the mountain becomes more fortress-like, protecting those of higher status. And at the very top lived King Chidakpo, his family, the ministers and their retainers. Royal Palace is located on the summit of the Saparang formation, and it's really like being in a penthouse. I mean, you have unobstructed views, 360 degrees. Uh, you can see the rest of the kingdom, the rest of the people below you. It really gives you a sense of being uh, in command and uh, uh, literally on top of the world. Being so high also made the palace a perfect strategic location. The sheer cliffs on three sides and the steep summit made the citadel virtually impregnable. John Beletsa and Siring Gilpo believe that this is where the mystery slowly begins to unfold. 
What stories could these weathered walls tell? Perhaps an answer to a question that stymied experts for decades. How did the royals of Gugge make their way to the top of the Acropolis? Certainly not the steep 30-minute hike up the narrow, craggy paths used by commoners. Sering thinks he may have discovered a clue to this mystery. At the far end of the royal complex is a wide open space, which for years experts assumed was a reception hall for the king. But after analyzing the soil composition there, Sering found traces of horsehair and manure. But if indeed there was a stable high on this mount, the question still remains. How could these horses have made their way 300 meters to the top of the citadel? The answer may have revealed itself after heavy rains. Soil erosion uncovered the entrance to a dark tunnel with a passageway that seemed to head down towards the valley below. <laughs> This secret tunnel would eventually prove to be useful, not just as transport, but for the survival of the entire kingdom. But perhaps the greatest revelations on Gugge were found here. Within this nearly inaccessible structure, are clues that hint at what life in Gugge must have been like. This is the Red Temple. Behind these ancient doors, some of Buddhism's finest murals tell a story of one of the greatest civilizations in Asia. One that in its heyday was unsurpassed across the Himalayas. These murals document life in Gugge and present a pictorial history of this once great kingdom. The murals of Gugge are simply stunning. Not only is it great artwork, but they encapsulate the experience of the kingdom, its culture, its peoples, its society, the ways in which they did business, the ways in which they moved about and traded. These are all represented in the mural. This is not merely artwork, this is history in visual form. Over the centuries, Tibet and its people have seen great upheavals. It began as a unified empire. Then around the year 850, the empire fell apart after a series of brutal civil wars. What emerged from the battles and the bloodshed was a separate kingdom, Gugge. Gugge flourished at the geographical crossroads to some of the greatest civilizations of the time. The king's wealth came from gold mines and was supplemented by arms given by the pilgrims traveling through the kingdom. None of these riches, however, could ensure what the kingdom needed most, water. Saparang lay amidst a vast and arid desert. In order to guarantee Gugge's survival, the king was forced to spend much of his resources transporting water to the city and to the farms that it depended on. The ancient irrigation canals, wells, and even a 20-kilometer-long aqueduct stretching from the Sutledge River to the citadel can still be seen amidst the ruins. 
evidence of the massive undertakings to keep this oasis alive. With their power and livelihood secure, the royals proceeded to live a life full of absolute opulence. The whim of the noble elite in Gugge to dress well goes beyond our, our bounds in, in the modern period. These were people who wore their clothes and their jewels with absolutely no sense of guilt or regret. They reveled in beauty. They reveled in opulence. Not only do they wear their beauty, they lived amidst it too, in their houses, the way they decorated them with the greatest artwork of the time. In this banquet room, Chidakpo and his queen would have enjoyed many social occasions, entertained by song and dance. Gugge's armory held the finest weaponry of the time. Its swordsmiths used sophisticated techniques to craft superior steel alloys, making their swords much sought after. But Gugge's wealth and power also attracted the attention of envious neighbors, who launched frequent attacks on the kingdom. Eventually, one such neighbor would discover a weakness to capitalize on, and Gugge's fate would be sealed forever. Just 30 kilometers away down the valley from the palace at Saparang is the monastery of Toling. Today, it is a modest structure, an eighth of its original size. But at its peak, Toling housed more than 900 monks and was the largest of Gugge's monasteries, both in size and influence, a power base akin to the Vatican. Pilgrims flocked to Toling, and with them came wealth, which they gave to the monastery. At the center of this spiritual power base was the chief abbot, King Chudakpo's brother. Toling had great power for the people of Tibet, Central Asia, and the subcontinent. It was the religious center par excellence of the time. And that gave it great moral authority, intellectual power, and political prestige that no other institution of the time had. Even before the rise of Gugge, Buddhism had long established roots in Tibet. But civil war in central Tibet would fragment and dilute Buddhism's role in society. From the wake of these upheavals, it was the early kings of Gugge that championed Buddhism in western Tibet. According to Sering Gelpo, the third king, Yeshe Ode, convened a Buddhist council the Great Prayer Festival of 1076. He invited great Buddhist thinkers from Tibet and beyond to attend. His aim was to strengthen Tibetan Buddhism and to propagate its philosophies. Yeshe Ode's initiative was to prove successful. Amazingly well-preserved centuries-old murals speak of this religious convention a spiritual gathering which planted the first seeds from which Tibetan Buddhism was reborn. From that point onward, Gugge became the spiritual and cultural heart of Tibetan Buddhism. The king enticed some of the greatest Buddhist leaders of his time. Not unlike headhunting CEOs today, he offered them riches beyond their dreams if they would only move to his kingdom. Gugge was at the center of a religious renaissance, one that was about to get even more intense. From the 11th century, Kashmir, part of Ladakh, and much of northeast India were being converted to Islam. For the next 300 years, Islam spread throughout most of the Indian subcontinent. As the Muslims advanced, they sacked Buddhist temples and persecuted the devout. Artists, scholars, and monks fled in fear. 
And it was Gugge that they fled to, because here they found sanctuary. Buddhism flourished in Gugge for two reasons. One was the fulfillment of the dream of the Tibetan emperors. The other was the need of the intellectual community in India to find a safe and secure home. Gugge was able to cater to both. And with these devotees came artisans, leading to an explosion of creativity. Frescoes hidden across the ancient Gugge ruins offers a glimpse of these heady times, not unlike Medici Florence during the Renaissance. Foreign artists from across the Buddhist world brought their own distinctive style of art, and here influenced each other, copying and fusing styles, ultimately creating an entirely new direction in art, the Gugge School. For me, one of the most stunning things about these murals is just the sheer diversity they hold in terms of human culture. They depict peoples from all over the Buddhist world. All of the cultures within the orbit of Gugge are there in these murals. The dry mountain air and remoteness of this area have helped make these murals some of the best preserved in Asia. It is argued that the Gugge Kingdom's commitment to Buddhism and the influx of refugee followers was such a powerful force. Tibetan Buddhism may never have survived without it. Today, Buddhism is still an integral part of everyday life in Tibet. It is an ancestral gift that permeates all levels of society. Tibetans still flock to Gugge even today. Not so much for the temples as for the wondrous peak towering over Saparang, the sacred Mount Kailash. These pilgrims are a reminder of the thousands who have come to Gugge before them. They are living proof of a deeper reason for this most unique journey in life. Pilgrims like the one Sering has come across here are on a trek around the perimeter of a sacred site in a ritual known as Kora. Some pilgrims will even go to profound lengths to demonstrate their faith through prostration. A devotee may take years to travel hundreds of miles in this manner. The Tibetans had this deep abiding interest in understanding the nature of human existence. Why are humans born? Where have they come from? And where do they go? First through their native traditions and later on through the medium of Buddhism. Tibetans explore the nature of human existence, what it means to be a human being. At the height of Toling's influence, it amassed considerable wealth from donations made by pilgrims. By King Jatakpo's reign, legend has it that Toling's influence and wealth was so great, it began to overshadow the practical needs of the kingdom. Gugge relied on a large pool of labor to work the irrigation schemes, grow the barley, and raise the herds. But as more and more men flocked to the monasteries, King Jodakpo saw his human resources dwindle and the economy began to suffer. By 1630, relations between the king and his brother had reached an all-time low. A bitter dispute broke out between them, a power struggle between the monastery and the monarchy, between religion 
and state. In the midst of all this tension, all that was needed was a tiny spark to bring about the beginning of the end for Gugge. For centuries, the abandoned ruins of Gugge and the kingdom that once flourished here remained a mystery and virtually unknown to the West. Its remote location in the arid highlands of Western Tibet kept it preserved almost intact. In 1957, China's People's Liberation Army visited Saparan, giving us the first ever motion pictures of the abandoned city. Amongst the heavily eroded ruins, they discovered intricate religious objects, icons and murals, telltale signs of grandeur and opulence. But it was inside caves, deep within the city, that the soldiers found the most intriguing revelations. Armor, shields, and hundreds of arrows. And in one particular cave, the Cave of the Dead, they found the most grisly of evidence. The remains of hundreds of headless corpses. Whose macabre remains are these? And how did they get here? Perhaps answers to these questions would shed some light on the mysterious disappearance of Gugge. But we would have to wait another 20 years for that illumination. In 1985, a team from Xi'an Archaeological Institute stumbled upon an intriguing clue. An ancient paper mask, probably used in a religious ceremony. It seemed quite ordinary at first, but when they turned it over, they found traces of an unrecognizable Western script. Months of research would reveal this to be a section of pages from a Bible, written in an ancient form of Portuguese used by early Jesuits. But how could the pages of an old Catholic Bible come to be part of a Tibetan shaman's mask in the far reaches of Gugge? In 1624, a Jesuit missionary, Father Antonio Andrade, wrote a book highly popular across Europe. In it, he describes his visit to an amazing country called Tibet. Father Andrade and his companion trekked from their mission in Goa in search of a long forgotten Christian state called Shambhala. Instead, they discovered Gugge. By this time, the story goes, tensions between Chudakpo and his brother were at an all-time high, and they were about to get worse. The king warmly welcomes Andrade. In his book, Andrade writes, As holy men, the king treated us with great reverence, and then explained somewhat to my surprise that he wished to understand our faith. This was as welcome as it was unexpected. Not only does Chudakpo proclaim the pair to be his personal guests, he invites them to stay and teach their beliefs, even ordering the building of a chapel. Such behavior would have infuriated the Buddhists at Toling. They saw the king's actions as a betrayal against Buddhism. It was a move that would not go unanswered. According to stories later recorded by Andrade, what happened next was an uprising against the king that would forever change the course of Gugge's history. Seeking to protect his stronghold, the head abbot sends word to his supporters in the neighboring kingdom of Ladakh, 500 kilometers away. Seizing this long-awaited opportunity, the Ladakhis marched across the border of Gugge, overcoming each fortress and embattlement in their path until they reached the capital, Saparan. By this time, Gugge's economic and political resources were strained. No reinforcements would be coming, and Saparan would have to face the invaders on its own. But taking Saparan would not be easy. The capital's western and southern approaches are sheer vertical walls, 
virtually attack-proof. At the summit, the royal palace was protected by a defensive wall running along its perimeter. The only possible approach for the Ladakhi forces was up a gently sloping hill on the northeast. But even this route was blocked by a substantial wall. The Ladakhi armies reached Saparang. They were flush with victory. They had conquered all of the satellite fortresses. They were now primed for the final battle. This final battle began is a matter of some uncertainty. But scholars believe the entrance to the city was stormed by the Ladakhis. through the city gates. The Ladakhis overcame Gugay's resistance and took control of the lower part of the citadel. But as they chased the retreating soldiers and citizens of Gugay up the passageways and tunnels to its summit, the Ladakhis found themselves sitting ducks. As they snaked towards the summit, these passageways narrowed. The Ladakhis had to pass through them almost single file making them easy targets for Gugay's forces. After taking heavy losses, the Ladakhis retreated to the lower ramparts to regroup. It became clear to the Ladakhis that a frontal assault on the citadel would be impossible. Instead, they chose to sit and wait. By surrounding the citadel, the Ladakhis were confident they had blocked all avenues of escape and fresh supplies, especially water. How long could Jadakpo and his people hold out in this dry environment? But unknown to the Ladakhis, Gugi might have had a trick or two up its sleeve. Deep beneath the citadel lies a network of caves that John Beletza and Serengelpo found to be most unusual. These were originally thought to be a royal winter retreat. To escape the bitter cold of winter, scholars believed the royal family would have come here to keep warm. But as John and Sering explore further, they find evidence that suggests that these caves may have had some other purpose. Sering reckons these caves could have stored food and supplies to last a year. So in theory, Gugay could have held out for a while. Apparently, these secret passages also allowed the besieged people of Gugay access to water. Some passages led to an exit near the Sutlej River. With food and water available, Saparang held out for close to a month before the Ladakhis stepped up the offensive. By now, the invaders had taken over the unprotected lower sections of the citadel and had gained a crucial bargaining chip in the process. Thousands of Gugay prisoners. 
Halfway up the citadel stands a very peculiar stone partition, unlike anything else found in Sabarang. The wall is very interesting. It's built of stone, whereby most of the other buildings were built primarily of rammed earth or mud brick. It doesn't have any obvious habitational function. It doesn't have any obvious defensive function. So why is that wall there? If storming the citadel through the tunnels was impossible, then the only other option would be to build a siege tower. And by the most ruthless of means, on the backs of captured Gugge prisoners. The royal precinct was virtually unassailable. The Ladakhi army reached a shelf beneath the sheer summit. They were stuck here for some time, around one month. So they began to build a siege tower with pressed Gugge labor. They had to bring stones from a black mountain on the far side of the Sutledge River. As the siege tower rose, it claimed the lives of many Gugge slaves. Ancient stories tell how the slaves were beaten so mercilessly that their organs showed through their flesh. But building a 100-meter structure of this kind would have been a near impossible engineering feat for its time. Instead, experts believe the Ladakhi siege tower was a psychological rather than physical gambit. How long could King Jodakpo bear to watch the daily torture and suffering of his captured subjects? As legend has it, the last king, Jodakpo, seeing the great suffering that his people were enduring, building this wall without food, and as they died and succumbed to the pressures of, of construction, he saw the great suffering that his people were undergoing. And he had great pity, the king of Gugge. And he decided, it must have been a difficult decision, but he decided in the end to surrender. According to legend, in the final hour of Gugge, King Chidakpo and his retinue made their poignant descent from summit to base, even bearing gifts of gold and silver to appease the invaders. But the reception they received from the Ladakhis is surrounded in controversy. In one fell swoop, the 700-year-old kingdom of Gugge had been conquered. But what happened after the king surrendered is still shrouded in mystery. John Beletzer and Serian Gelpo have their own ideas. Ideas that take them to the infamous cave of the dead. Could the bodies that the Chinese army saw more than 50 years ago be the corpses of the last royals of Gugge? The only answer is the overwhelming stench of more recent decay. The cave, unfortunately, has once again become a burial site. And in recent years, the remains of Tibetans have once again been deposited there. And this, this is actually complicating the archaeology about determining what was really there originally and what's come after. In Tibet, the dead receive a sky burial. This means corpses are carried away by birds. Skilled morticians cut up the dead body to encourage eagles and vultures to consume the flesh. Local tales suggest that at one time, the cave may have held as many as 400 skeletons. But over time, Bandits, scholars, and the curious have taken much, leaving but a few remains. Tibetan rituals of the dead forbid any possible DNA studies. But John Beletsa believes this could very well be the resting place of the last king of Gugge. There's some evidence that lends credence to the idea that indeed the corpses in the cave are those of the royal family. Most of them seem to have been beheaded. Uh, to have undergone execution. And so that probably would not have been the case with the common soldier who would have been, uh, who would have fallen on battlefield. John's theory supports one legend that tells of a brutal and merciless execution. After having surrendered his kingdom, 
the king and his ministers were beheaded on the spot. The royal women also met an equally gruesome end. There is a poem that purportedly tells of the massacre. It describes how the royal women were taken and thrown from the palace ramparts. To the people below, these brightly dressed princesses look like spring flowers falling from heaven. The Ladakhi soldiers yelled and shouted to see more and more flowers. As for the abbot, he met his doom at the end of a Ladakhi sword. Treachery was repaid by treachery, as he was double-crossed by his supposed allies. But a mystery still remains. Why was Saparang entirely abandoned? From the top of the citadel, you can still see the imprints left by the ancient aqueduct, following the contours of the hill. Even the legend Serengelpo speaks of has a basis in science. Guge is in the shadow of three of the world's largest mountain ranges, the Himalayas, the Karakoram, and the Kunlun. Research shows that the climate in West Tibet has been steadily changing over the past millennia, and that man has been on the losing end of an age-old battle with nature. Areas that were once moist and relatively lush are now dry and have become deserts. And in Guge, this process is all the more intensified it's because it's located in the rain shadow of Asia's greatest mountain ranges. Evidence of this ongoing force, known as desertification, comes from satellite photographs of once arable fields, now abandoned. But not all of them moved away. In the middle of the desert-like conditions that surround modern Saparang, there are still a few places with enough moisture to grow barley. The fall of the Guge Kingdom might not have been triggered by just one major military campaign, but rather from a long-term sustained assault from Mother Nature herself. Even today, 400 years after the fall of the citadel, Nature is still battling with the remaining few farmers, struggling to eke out an existence from the land. The farmers explain to John that they have been trying to grow barley in these fields. During the time of the Guge Kingdom, they say the water level was much higher than it is now. And the lack of water has now driven them to the lower areas right next to the river. The demise of the Guge Kingdom was the end of a line of Tibetan monarchs that stretched from 1630 back to 200 years AD. But the legacy of Guge lives on in festivities, like this annual horse fair, as they would have centuries ago. Buddhist monks are on hand to bless the jockeys, wishing them a successful and safe endeavor. Participants dip their fingers into beer and flick it heavenward, a sign of gratitude and an offering to the divine. But it is when the races begin that we are reminded of the lineage of these hardy men. Cavalry skills passed down for generations from father to son, each the proud bearer of the heritage of his warrior ancestors. At a sacred prayer site, Serengelpo, a native of these parts, makes his offering to these ancestors and the divine. 
After the fall of the last Gugei king, Saparang became an unpleasant place for its citizens. The Ladakhis administered the region for 50 years before being driven out by the Tibetans and their Mongol allies. The Mongols did not take well to the deep canyons and dry lands of western Tibet. They decided to relocate the capital to higher, more open ground. With that relocation of the capital of western Tibet, Gugei utterly falls into ruin and decay, which is continuing to the very present day. After the defeat and demise of Gugei's last king, the reins of power were eventually taken over by the spiritual leader of another Buddhist sect, the Fifth Dalai Lama. Ironically, the king's brother, the abbot who fought for a Buddhist state, had won the final battle after all. The ancient kings of Gugei had a vision of a land of Dharma, of sacred holiness, which has left an indelible mark not only on Saparang, but on all of Tibet. Their gift of Buddhism remains strong and deeply ingrained in the memory of what was once a great kingdom, the kingdom of Gugei.